Hello, I'm Esther Vida backstage at the Democratic National Convention in Denver. Join me tonight on North Carolina Now as I bring you a conversation with two women who got prime time spots to give speeches at the convention. Esther. Now, for people watching across the state who may never have visited downtown Raleigh, I want to give them a perspective of where this event is taking place. In a one block radius of this event, we've got the General Assembly and they're reconvening on January 28th. Down the block is the Lieutenant Governor's office and this is a position that was held by Beth Perdue for eight years and it's a position now being taken over by Walter Dalton. Now down the road is the old state capitol and after the swearing in ceremonies of today, that is where Beth Perdue will be taking office. While the North Carolina delegation may be located in the back of the room at this convention, they have not gone unnoticed by the Obama camp. North Carolina is a battleground state, partly due to all the new voters. As an immigrant and a world traveler, I have been privileged to see many of the world's marvels, and I am very keenly aware of the importance of visiting different countries to learn about other cultures. All I'm suggesting is that the next time you consider taking a trip, think local. You may be surprised at what there is to see and do right in your backyard. Hello everyone, I'm Esther Varda. Thanks for joining us and welcome to the last of three gubernatorial candidate forums UNCTV will hold before the May 6th primary. UNCTV has invited the major candidates from the Republican and Democratic parties to join us for these forums. The mission began like many others, carrying crew and cargo. But when the C-130 cargo plane returned to the United States, it carried a very special group group of orphan children. Incidentally, I've been in contact with the members of the 95th Civil Affairs Brigade that flew down on the same flight we were on. They are in Haiti for a three-month mission to help rebuild the country's physical infrastructure. They report a long road ahead before the country can get back on its feet, not only because of the massive destruction, but also because there's still no government structure in place. Before landing here at Port-au-Prince, the plane had to circle around three times. That's because there's only one runway here. And imagine this, there's dozens of countries trying to land and help. There's also nonprofit organizations. This is one of the biggest problems the Air Force had had in trying to get personnel and equipment here to Haiti. Thank you so much for taking part in this very important discussion. Viewers, we want to get as many of your questions answered as possible tonight. So if you <coughs> call into tonight's program, we ask you to keep your questions to 30 seconds in length, or I will interrupt and ask you to finish with that. Our first question comes from Carol, who emailed from Sunset Beach. She wants to know where each of you stand on health care reform. President Carter, uh, last time North Carolina voted for a Democrat uh, to the White House was 1976. I it was it you. <laughs> <laughs> and so now it's a battleground state once again. What do you think is, are the chances? What do the Democrats need to do to get North Carolina back into the We team? need to do at least two very important things. January, during your State of the State address, you talked about North Carolina's corn seed that we will not hurt education in North Carolina. You even said that we would increase per pupil spending. This budget makes significant cuts to education. Do you think this will hurt or change the education here in North Carolina? I, th I think at the end of the day, when you add in the recovery dollars, the war in Iraq. Yes. There are those that say the insurgency has worked. There are those that say it doesn't. Regardless, it has raised a lot of questions about the role of the United States in these hot spots. We've seen Pakistan, Iran, we've just recently mm -hmm. Georgia. When do we draw the line of going in or being just bystanders? Well, I think it, it depends on the individual situation. So how did this tiny Asian nation become such a powerhouse? And what can North Carolina and the United States learn from Singapore? A delegation made up of lawmakers, educators, and policymakers visited Singapore to learn more. Singapore's labor force has gone through a drastic transformation in the past 45 years. From the 60s, when most of the people were working in the garment and textile industries, to today, where there's a large pool of people working in the biotech, IT, and banking industries. How did it happen? 
Government officials say it's a carefully orchestrated plan. Alcoa has applied for a new 50-year license from FERC. The state has intervened, citing Alcoa's alleged mismanagement of the environment, its resources, and loss of jobs. Alcoa is fighting back. Unfortunately, elderly abuse is a growing problem that affects thousands of victims across the country. Abuse crosses all socioeconomic populations and is not isolated to any particular race or gender. Standing in the heart of Bangalore, down the road is Dell, IBM, Microsoft, and many other big companies. This area is known as the Silicon Valley of Asia. In fact, many economists say that India has one of the fastest growing economies in the world. From an early age, students in India attend intense math and science classes, but it takes more than just a focused curriculum to catapult students to the top as compared to others around the world. Currently, the state only taxes a certain percentage of services offers, and this would, again, expand it to 80 plus. And the question became, does that mean golfers, uh, barbers, lawyers, who will be taxed? And, and so talk about what they're really, the, the menu of items, really wide menu of items that they're looking at.